Good evening, Suki Hotu. Welcome to this uh, evening's sharing on question and answer forum. This is the sixth in the series. So today, 12th of April, is uh, QA forum number six. So welcome to all of you who are joining in from various parts of the world. I think there are people from US, some people from Europe, and so on, Philippines. So welcome. Let's begin today's sharing. Today, we're going to deal with three interesting questions. The first one is very much uh, in, about the conventional world. Let's take a look at the question. It came from one of the devotees who had some concerns and so raised that question. So I decided to offer some uh, sharing and some guidance on this. So the first question is uh, about a marriage, a relationship in a marriage. And the question is, can an ardent practicing Buddhist continue living with a partner who is indifferent towards Buddhism? Hope you can give an explanation to the above. Well, I cannot explain, uh, you know, whether a, a non-Buddhist or one who is indifferent to Buddhism can live with uh, one who is a practicing Buddhist. It's really a matter of the relationship. Relationships are very unique, and it is very important to recognize the fact that relationships are really so unique between two individuals, no third person can truly understand what it's all about, not even family members, because there's so many complexities involved behind the whole relationship. So I'm not here to offer any advice. I'm not here to offer any explanations because uh, I it would not be in a position to be able to, to give that kind of advice. And I'm also not offering any counseling. And in fact, that is one of those things that I personally uh, do not uh, uh, like to go into, and that is offering counseling. We cannot counsel someone in that sense. We can only guide. That's the best we can do. Unless we live a perfect life, we can't really counsel other people. We can guide people. So today, in answer, in response to this question, I shall just offer some guidance. I hope uh, if this is not uh, what you expect, then please forgive me. I will just offer whatever I can uh, find from the Buddha Dharma from the sutras to offer some guidance. So I'm just guiding. Guiding is basically pointing a direction for you to look into. And that hopefully can help you see something which you may not uh, have under, uh, realized before. So let's uh, begin with some of these things that I have to offer. Of course, the most famous of all sutra dealing with relationships and family life and so on is this Sigalovada Sutra, where the Buddha gave, gave some advice to this young uh, Brahmin, Sigala, uh, Sigala uh, yeah, I don't know the actual name. Well, he gave some advice uh, to this young Brahmin. So Sigalavaka, that's the, that's the name, Sigalvalaka, Sigalovaka something like that yeah the best uh, the best guide I can offer you is this beautiful piece by Ayasma Agachita where he he was attending or blessing a newly wed Buddhist couple and he offered some guidance on responsibilities of a spouse so take note of that link uh, by the way, I would like to point out, uh, all day long, I've been trying to get access at that uh, tiny.cc link. Unfortunately, the tiny.cc website is uh, not working, but there's, therefore, I'm posting here the long, the long version of the link. You can then access this link and take a look at the advice and guidance offered by Ayasma Agachita where he made some references to this Sigalovada Sutra. And this is very interesting. So please feel free to help yourself. And this is 
also not only for the person who asked this question, anyone else who might have an interest on uh, exploring relationships from a Buddhist perspective, this is a very helpful piece that you can refer to. So I, I won't go into any details, uh, you know, I fully respect Ayasma Agatita, who actually is also one of my teachers. Uh, I attend a number of his workshops on Satipatthana, on uh, Vipassana and Samatha, and also a few other workshops. Right? So he is one of my teacher. I highly respect him, so I will not try to uh, comment any further. So please feel free to go into this article and uh, see for yourself. So this is one piece. Uh, there are a few others I'm offering. Uh, in terms of preservation of wealth and happiness, this Sig Sigalovada Sutra would be the, the best. So this is the advice the Buddha gave to Sigalaka. So you can also uh, take a look at the actual sutra in Diga Nikaya number 31. And there is a very beautiful piece made by Venerable Dhamma Siri, where he made a pictorial presentation of the Buddha's advice, where it, it's kind of interesting, you know, it's not so boring reading words all the way through. So this is another link. Unfortunately, any link that says tiny.cc probably will not work for now. Uh, you can try tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, the website has been down the whole day, this tiny.cc website. It's a free website enabling us to use uh, simple shortcut uh, labels to uh, insert very lengthy, complicated links so people don't have to remember all the alphabets and numbers. But unfortunately, that website is down for now, so try it tomorrow. This is the pictorial presentation of this Sigalovada Sutra by Venerable Dhamma Siri. And you can also take a look at uh, other sutras. So this is a very interesting sutra that uh, basically talking about the eight personality traits that lead to happiness and well-being for now and for the future. So again, this deals with relationship from a Buddhist point of view. So please feel free to access that. Again, uh, be aware that uh, the tiny.cc link will not be working uh, un until further notice, so you can try that later. But there, there is a sutra here, Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Eight, Sutra number 54. Right, so you can access that one. This is the Diga Janu Sutra. And of course, the Sutra on Happiness and Blessings, the Mangala Sutra, well, everybody knows that. So you probably have your own links to it, but I'm just sharing a couple of links here in case you are interested. Uh, this Sutra is repeated both in the, in the Sutta Nipata and also in, in the KP5. So they are repeated, basically the same thing where the Buddha uh, taught 11 blessings that can bring happiness. Right. And here is a very helpful link. You can go directly in, and this is developed by, uh, and this is from the Library of Nalanda, Malaysia, developed by Nalanda Institute of Malaysia, where it offered a background story on this Mangala Sutra and translations into English, verse by verse, and there is also the detailed Pali text, as well as the Pali verse by verse translation. So it's a very helpful educational piece on Mangala Sutra, which is the Sutra on Happiness. So please uh, go into this. You will really find this very interesting, right? So this is helpful. I hope this, this will help people understand better about this Mangala Sutra and not just chant it blindly and having this blind faith, wishing things to happen, you know, have a better understanding of the background story and also the translation verse by verse. And there is also another Sutra, Bariya Sutra, Sata Bariya Sutra, Anguttara Nikaya, Book 
of 7, Sutra number 63. Now, I had some difficulty getting hold of this sutra because it was listed as uh, 69 or 59. So I had to search around and finally, uh, with a bit of, uh, uh, quite a bit of tr trying, striving, I finally got it as Anguttara Nikaya 7.63. And I have the link there. Unfortunately, uh, the link is also in tiny.cc, Bariya Sutra, where the Buddha spoke of seven types of wives. You see, the Buddha was at uh, uh, at was doing some uh, dharma sharing or rather giving a discourse when suddenly uh, one of the ladies in the household was making a lot of noise, shouting at the servants and so on. So then he uttered this sutra, in this verse, explaining that there are seven uh, types of wives. The first three are not wholesome, and the last four are more wholesome. The first three is talking about a wife who kills, a wife who steals, and a wife who is arrogant, right? tyrant. And then the next four types is a motherly wife, a sisterly wife, a friend, friendly wife, like a good friend, and of course, one who slaves for the family. So these are seven types of wives. Again, this would be helpful to help people have a better understanding about uh, mar uh, marriage relationships in, from the Buddhist perspective. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, besides all these, there's not much more I can offer. I'm not here to offer advice. I'm not here to offer counseling. I just guiding, directing you to some links you can have access to and read them yourself. If you have any questions after this related to the Dharma, please feel free to drop the question in uh, in the comment after this video. Or you can, you can message to me later on uh, if you have any further questions on what you find. So I hope this has been helpful. And the next question is uh, a question about householder becoming enlightened. A simple question, can householder become enlightened? How high can a householder attain if remain living as a householder? So, of course, a lot of us who are householders, when we are new to Buddhism, we are very interested in this question. This is a question I think a lot of people are very interested in. So I shall attempt to offer some suggestions and uh, directions, some guidance, and also drawing from lessons from my teacher, Venerable Dr. Punaji. So let us begin with looking into the... Uh, and the response to this very interesting question. I think a lot of people have this in their mind. Can a householder become enlightened? If not, how high can a householder attain if he, if he remains living as a householder? Okay, so let's take a look at what Bhante has to say about giving up this household life. Right? Basically, Bhante Punaji points out that it is not possible for a householder normally to become fully enlightened. Of course, there are certain attainments a householder can accomplish, but as far as the highest and most supreme attainment of Nibbana, as Bhante Punaji pointed out, it is not possible. And it's not only Bhante Punaji who is saying that. There's a sutra where the Buddha also mentioned that. So now let's take a look at the uh, the uh, advice from Bhante Punaji. The person who is normally leading the household life, that is the common way of living today, Whether by living in that way, a person can bring all suffering to an end. As the Buddha says, no, it is not possible. To gain freedom from suffering, 
you have to give up that household way of living. But everyone cannot do that. This is why it is a gradual process of evolution of the human being. Giving up the household life, giving up the pursuit of sensual pleasure, is a necessary step in awakening from the dream of existence. Because the normal household life is all being in the dream of existence. Okay, Bhante Punaji basically pointed out that uh, living a household life is actually engaging in uh, the dream of existence. What he really meant by that is that we go through life in the household, householder life, where we are exposed to a lot of things that keep reminding us uh, of existence. And that's why he, he pointed out this is like a dream of existence. And all this reminder continue to bond us or tie us down into the mindset of existence. And as long as that uh, remains in our mind, we will, con we will never be enlightened, right? We will be reborn life after life, and that is called samsara, because we are tied down and bonded to this continuous cycle of rebirth. Uh, and so that is uh, one one of the items so let me open up the screen sorry about that okay now in this uh, sutra the tevicha gota sutra where the buddha was uh, giving advice to vacha gota uh, vacha gota asked buddha one question here it says master gotama is there any householder who without abandoning the fetter of householdership on the dissolution of the body has made an end of suffering. Okay, so for those who are new to the this kind of wordings, I'll just explain. Right, householder, of course, is referring to people like us who are not living the life of a monk or a nun. We have not renounced from this conventional world, <clears throat> um, so we are continuously living with our family and engaging in interactions with friends and social network, businesses, and so on. Abandoning the fetter of householdership. So the Buddha pointed out that, that there are these 10 fetters. Fetters are basically bonds, things that bond us to existence. So there are these 10 bonds right, that, that tie us down and Therefore, if as long as we are living the life of a householder, then we are continuously exposed and experiencing these bonds. We have to uh, learn to abandon them. But as long as we are householder, we are not able to abandon them. Therefore, it would not be possible to become enlightened. And then the next part that says, on the dissolution of the body. And this is a very common phrase you will find throughout many sutras. This is just uh, the Buddha's way of explaining when you die, basically. Of course, there is no you, there is no me. So when the person, uh, the life of that person comes to an end. That's why it says dissolution of the body. This is basically the life in the body ceases, right? And on dissolution of the body has made an end of suffering. So end of suffering basically refers to the complete cessation of all suffering. And that is when a person has attained the uh, arahanship. That person has become fully enlightened. Then that person has completely 
uh, ended or uh, ended put an end to all suffering. So here the question, Master Gotama, is there any householder who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership, on the dissolution of the body has made an end of suffering? So Vajakota was basically asking, if a householder does not give up the life of a house householdership, can that person, when he dies, become an arahant? So the Buddha's answer is very simple and straightforward. He says, Vacha. There is no householder who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership, on the dissolution of the body, has made an end of suffering. In other words, the Buddha confirmed that there has never been anyone who continues to live the life of a householder and becomes enlightened. This is what the Buddha has pointed out. Now, uh, some of us may have read in some sutras and commentaries that there are people who are not monks and nuns who might have become enlightened. Now, be aware that uh, those are cases of very unique individuals. Some of them actually were from another faith. So they have renounced householdership, just that uh, they may not have become monks and nuns under uh, under the Buddha, so they have not yet become the Buddha's disciple, but uh, they could become enlightened, right? So they could become enlightened because they have already abandoned householdership through their other faith. Right? They could be coming from other religions like Jain, and they could also be ascetic, and ascetic has already abandoned householdership. So it is possible that an ascetic who is not a direct disciple of the Buddha may have heard the discourses of the Buddha and become enlightened. There, there are many such cases where people become enlightened as ascetic before they then uh, went to put the Buddha and paid, uh, basically became disciples of the Buddha. So there are May, uh, a number of such cases explained in the commentary and in the Dhammapada. Right? So basically, that's what the Buddha has confirmed, that if you continue to live the life of a householder, you will not become uh, enlightened. He, he basically pointed out there is no such a, such a thing that has ever happened before. Now, when we talk about these fetters, what are they? So these, there are these 10 fetters that bond us. And we have to give up all of them. We have to eradicate all 10 fetters in order to become fully enlightened. But that is the ultimate stage. That is the final stage. Before reaching the final stage, there are really three other stages. So in other words, there are four levels of enlightenment. Becoming an Arahant is the ultimate, the final stage. That is the highest and most supreme attainment. Lesser than that, there is the attainment of the, uh, the non-returner, the Sakadagami. Lesser than that, there is the attainment of the one's returner. Sorry, I, I beg your pardon. The attainment of the non-returner is Anagami. And then lesser than that is the attainment of one's returner, the Sakadagami. And then lesser than that is the attainment of one who within seven lives as a human can become enlightened, and that is the Sotapan, right? So there are the four levels. So let's take a look at these four stages of enlightenment and how these 10 fetters uh, correspond to the stage of, uh, stage of attainment. So if we were to look at these 10, the important ones to focus on is the first three, basically. Personality perspective, Sakaya Ditti. Uh, then Vichikicha, which is often translated as doubt, skeptical doubt. But Bhante Punaji has pointed out very clearly that uh, it is actually cognitive dissonance, not skeptical doubt. And cognitive dissonance is actually a very precise explanation of the meaning of Vichikicha. In fact, it's one of the most precise English terms that exactly explains a Pali word beautifully because 
There are very few English words that can easily explain a Pali word and a complex Pali word like Vichikicha. But uh, this is one phrase that, that explains that. And then, of course, the third one is Silabata Paramasa. Then basically, this is someone who is, a, you know, this is translated as attachment to rites and rituals. But Bhante Punaji pointed out heteronomous morality. Heteronomous meaning uh, connected with external things. That means you, uh, you engage in very moral behavior because of external influence. You see other people do it and you follow them. And someone tells you this is what you should do and you just do it because you were told. So that's why Bande called that heteronomous morality. You practice virtuous morality because of external influence, either from what you have observed and you are following or uh, from what uh, uh, someone is telling you to do. Right, so that's why it's it's translated as uh, uh, attachment to rites and rituals. But a more precise explanation of that is heteronomous morality. The opposite of that, right? The opposite that means if you are not uh, practicing heteronomous morality, the exact opposite of that is autonomous morality. Autonomous meaning from within. That means you have understood the Dharma. You have trust in the Dharma, confidence, and devotion to practice from rising from within, your willpower. Uh, then you are not practicing heteronomous morality, morality. You would be practicing autonomous morality. That's the opposite of heteronomous morality. Okay, so these are the first three. If we can, you know, initially during the early practice, we should try to minimize this gradually. We can't eradicate them immediately, but we can try to minimize them step by step. And if we can completely eradicate them, we would then become stream entrant, right? So that means if the first three uh, fetters are completely eradicated, then that person would have entered the stream, so to speak. And that person would attain that first level of Arya, that means the, they call it noble one, but it's not. It's actually super normal person. As Bhante Punaji has always pointed out, the word Arya does not mean noble. It means super normal, above normal. So a person who can abandon these three is not a normal person. This is a person who has attained a, a state of, of uh, being above normal, super normal. So the first level is of Arya, is the stream entrance, Sotapan. Such a person, within seven lifetimes as a human, uh, after being reborn, after seven lifetimes maximum, this is the maximum. It may not even take that long. It could be within one lifetime or whatever. It, maximum, seven lifetime, of re, seven lifetime of rebirth, that person would become an Arahant. Right? So this is the Sotapan. First to third fetters are fully eradicated. I won't be going into explaining all these fetters because that's going to take the whole evening just to explain a few of these fetters. I'm, I'm sure you have heard about this elsewhere. Uh, maybe some other time I can go into this. Right? So if we can get rid of these three fetters, then we are Sotapan. And the next, oh, yeah. The next is that we would have, uh, there's something wrong with this. Give me one more minute. Yeah, that's better. Okay, that's better, right. Then after attaining that first stage, that person begins to practice uh, more and try to abandon number four and number five. And if that person can substantially reduce greatly reduce number four and number five, then that person would then become, attain the second level of uh, Arya, that is the one's returner, sak Sakadagami. Uh, that means first to third fetters fully eradicated and fourth and fifth fetters are greatly reduced. 
And it's not easy, as you can see here, a householder will have great difficulty eradicating completely number four and number five. This is why a householder normally at best can only be a sotapan. Even trying to, to be a sakadagami is not easy. The only possibility is that this householder has uh, consciously disengaged from a lot of sensual activities and therefore is able to reduce substantially the lust for pleasures. Actually, here doesn't really mean that you're craving for all kinds of pleasures, but here is simply that you experience something pleasant and you, en and you, and you enjoy it and say, oh, I like it. You know, just liking it, that itself, you are then experiencing this lust for sensual pleasures. Right? So this is not really talking about going crazy about sensual pleasures. So how can a householder get rid of that? Because he's constantly faced with all kinds of surroundings that he is uh, experiencing the pleasures. Your bed, for instance, you're sleeping on a comfortable bed. But of course, there are very seriously practicing Buddhists who may not have renounced and decided to live very simple life. There are even uh, lay people who are living in the forest. But they are not engaging in householder life. That's the point, you see. People who uh, go into the forest to live, to get away from these exposures, they are not living a householder life anymore. So in other words, if you're still living at home with your family and friends and you have social activity, then it's almost very, very difficult to substantially reduce that, let alone uh, eliminate it. But it is possible that there are some people who restrain themselves so well that they could bring number four and number five, uh, reduce it substantially. So it is still possible for a householder, but with very stern self-discipline, can still accomplish this second level of Sakadagami, once returner. Then a person, then such a person would keep practicing to try to completely eradicate number four and number five. So such a person who has completely eradicated all five, right, that would be the Anagami. That is number one to number five fetters are fully eradicated. And a householder basically can, cannot do this because of number four and number five, the householder will continuously be exposed right, to number four, number five. Whereas a person who decides to leave the, the family life and go to the forest or break away from urban life, right, uh, go into a retreat, then it is possible. But such a person is no longer living a householder life. right. So therefore, if you're able to eradicate the five completely, you would have attained the third stage of uh, Arya, uh, supernormal stage, that is the Anagami. And finally, uh, such a person would continue to practice and eliminate number six to number 10. And that is very hard. That means that jump from Anagami to Arahanship, that jump is very severe because it would require a person to completely eradicate all 10 fetters and that such a person would then become the arahant, the breaker of bonds, all 10 fetters fully eradicated. So this is how it works. So I hope that answers the question about how far can a householder uh, accomplish, right? At best, Sotopan, and he, if he, uh, if he reduces substantially whatever and has very strong self-discipline, then he could become uh, Sakadagami, but certainly not further than that. Unless, of course, he leaves home and then he's no longer a householder. Okay, then this Vachagota has more questions to the Buddha about this. And Vajagota then asks, is there any householder who, without abandoning the fetters of householdership on the dissolution of the body, has gone to heaven? Ah, this is interesting. You see, a person who has practiced uh, virtuous morality to a very high level and perfected his behavior to the point that he basically can do no wrong, 
And if that person does not attain arahantship, that person can be reborn in a higher realm, right? In basically reborn in the heavens. So the question here is not from earth go to heaven. It is when the person dies, will be reborn in heavenly realms. So that's really what this question means. When a person dies, that is on the dissolution of the body, that person is then reborn in the higher realm, the deva realms. Right. And the Buddha said, they are, you know, the Buddha said they're numerous. So the answer here, Vacha, they are not only 100 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 500, but far more householders who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership on the dissolution of the body, has gone to heaven. So in other words, it is possible to be reborn in the higher realms if a person could perfect his uh, virtuous morality. That means he's so self-disciplined that he is a very virtuous person who basically can do no wrong. Right? So that is the answer of the Buddha. So in other words, if you cannot become enlightened, you can still be reborn in the higher realm. As a householder, it is possible. Now, Ajivika or Ajivaka, this is another group of practitioners during the time of the Buddha. They're not really practitioners. They are people who pretend to be monks. They dress up like the monks. They make themselves look like they are like ascetics in front of people. They, they show as though they are refraining from everything. Uh, but basically, they sit around waiting for... They do that so that they can get free food because they know that monks and ascetics, people who have basically abandoned householder life, they don't cook their own meals. Then household, uh, other people, uh, the average household holder, would offer food to arms food to those people. So the Ajivaga are people who pretend to be like that and try to get free food, right? According to this, it says the householder can go to heaven. But in the case of the Ajivaka, he cannot go to heaven. Why is that? Because the Ajivakas were not uh, practicing the, the good karma. That is the reason. The, the, the behavior of the Ajivakas were not uh, really good behavior. If they behaved in the good way, then they can go to heaven. Because we are not sure what an Ajivaka really is, but according no, to... Ajivaka simply means they were beggars. Beggars. Yeah. Waiting for food to be given to them. Ah. So in other words, in their normal life, they don't practice sila themselves. Ah. Ah. That's, that's why they don't go to heaven. That's right. So those who want to go to heaven, you know what to do la. Ah. So those who want to go to heaven, basically practice good morality. That's really what it is, right? So, now again, we take a look at these 10 fetters and we note that if you're able to abandon the first three fetters, you would attain uh, the, the state of uh, Sotapan. Right? You would attain the Arya, the first level of Aryahood, and that is the Sotapan, the one who within seven life will become enlightened maximum. But uh, it can also happen within one lifetime, and that has happened before. So if you're able to abandon those three. So let's take a look at Bhante Punaji explaining this point. What is called the supernormal eightfold way, that also starts with a goal. And this is why the Samma Sankappa is called goal orientation. And so the goal becomes Nibbana.
Nibbana is the goal, ending of suffering, ending of the insecurity of life. And once that becomes the goal, which is coming in the form of tranquility of mind, and that leads to samma vacha, samma khabbanta, samma ajiva. Now that is when that when your mind is turned in the proper direction, then you begin to behave in the proper way, which means you begin to speak in the right way, act in the right way, and live in the right way. So up to that point is what is called the first step which is to enter the stream, sotapanna. So a sotapanna, one who has entered the stream, is a person who has uh, come down the path in five steps. Samma ditti, samma sankappa, samma vacha, samma khammant, samma ajiva. Up to that point is the five steps. And that is also seen as breaking three fetters. Sakha ditti, vichikicca and silabhata paramasa. So Sakhaditi is simply to personalize, yeah, I call it the personal, personality perspective. You are personalizing your emotions. By personalizing the emotion, you are encouraging the emotion. Here we are trying to get rid of the emotion. That is, you are discarding the emotion. So, the personalizing is given up. And uh, vichikicca is where your mind is turning in two different directions. Now you have given up going after sensual pleasures and emotions. So, because your goal has been tranquility of mind. So, vichikicca disappears with that. And then comes Silabhata Paramasa. Silabhata Paramasa really refers to the sila and the bhata. Sila means to avoid bad behavior. Bhata means to practice good behavior. Paramasa means, para means foreign. Amasa means to receive except you are not accepting this de behavior because other people want you to behave you are behaving because you want to behave because not to satisfy other people so that is not silabhata paramas so it's very important to understand that this is called uh, autonomic, autonomous behavior. 
or autonomous morality instead of heteronomous morality. Heteronomous morality is Silabhata Paramas. Instead of behaving to satisfy other people, you are behaving in the proper way because you realize the need for it. But then from there on comes Samma Vayama, which is how to gain control over your emotion. Okay, so Bhante basically is ex explained that, right? So if we were to look at the ten fetters, uh, there are four stages of awakening, attaining Aryahut, and the first, of course, is uh, Sotapan, abandoning, uh, eradicating the first three fetters, then Sakadagami, substantially reducing number four and number five after eradicating the first three, and Anagami, eradicating the first five, and finally, the Arahan, the breaker of bonds, uh, one who basically has uh, eradicated also the last five of the ten fetters. So Bande Punaji was pointing out that uh, for the householder, we can practice the first two parts, and the first is in the yellow boxes, that is uh, Sama Ditti and Sama Sankappa, which is right view and right intentions. Or Sama Sankappa sometimes is translated as right uh, thought, that means wanting to do something. But Bhante calls it harmonious perspective for right view. For, harm, for Samaditi, it is harmonious perspective. That means you have a very clear perspective of what reality is, the realities of life. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. And you understand that uh, adequately. So then you have right, you have harmonious perspective. Then harmonious orientation is when you want to accomplish it. You want to do it. You have a goal in mind. You want to develop, cultivate and develop yourself further through the practice of Dharma. And when you want that, then you go into the practice of Sila. And that would be harmonious speech, harmonious action, and harmonious, harmonious lifestyle. Right? And basically, Bande pointed out, if you can practice this very well, right, up to the state of near perfection, basically, you could become a Sotapan. So a Sotapan is possible. A Sotapan, a, a person can attain Sotapan without really accomplishing very much in meditation. It's, meditation is helpful, but it is not mandatory, right? And the last part is the meditation part, Samadhi. Unfortunately, the word Samadhi is often translated as concentration. Uh, the more accurate meaning is stillness of mind, tranquility. Sometimes Bhante calls it mental equilibrium. So that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, what it's all about. You can attain Sotapan uh, by practicing the first five of the Eightfold Way and perfecting your practice. It's not just practicing it, but perfecting your practice. Now, um, one of the ways to perfect the practice of Sila is to practice Metta. And metta belongs to uh, a group of four divine dwellings called the Brahma Vihara. I will actually talk about this in, in response to the next question, because the next question is talking about metta. So I will, uh, I will explain this further uh, in connection with uh, uh, awakening, stages of awakening, when I respond to the next question. So let's move on to the next question. The next question is, uh, I am not sure what is difference between metta, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion. Can you explain this? Okay, so here the person asking this is coming from the, I, I'm just guessing uh, that coming from the, the angle that uh, he thinks that loving kindness and compassion are the same. He's not too sure what's the difference, so now he wants to uh, to learn about the difference. Actually, the best person to explain this is Bhante Punaji. 
So I'm going to let Bande Punaji explain this to you. So first, let's listen to Bande Punaji explain what is metta. Bande translate metta with a number of phrases. One is universal benevolence. Another one is goodwill. Another one is loving kindness. But they all basically mean the same thing. The concern for the well-being of others, right? The teaching of the Buddha is based on what is called metta. Metta is the Pali word. The Sanskrit word is Maitri. And that word means universal goodwill or universal benevolence or a universal interest in the welfare of all beings, a concern about the welfare of all beings. That means it is a broad mind, not a narrow mind. So the five precepts are practiced not to avoid punishment or to gain rewards. The five precepts are practiced because we are concerned about the welfare of others. The five precepts are mainly concerned about how we relate to other people. All that is based on how we relate to other people. It is based on a concern for the welfare of all beings. Not only thinking about ourselves. It is based on a broad mind. That breadth of mind is what is called metta or maitri. This is why I call it universal benevolence or universal goodwill. Mitta cannot be only for human beings with no compassion for animals. That is not metta. Metta is for all beings. It is a concern for the welfare of all beings. That is the broad mind where we think of all beings. It is very important to understand this because the morality or ethics of the teachings of the Buddha is based on a broad mind and when we cultivate metta we are cultivating a broad mind when we cultivate metta we are cultivating a broad mind a concern for the well-being of all beings for the welfare of all beings. Basically, it's about reaching out, spreading out, so the length 
and the breadth of it. That's really what Bante meant. Now, Metta is part of the four divine dwellings, Chattari Brahma Vihara. And it is also called the four immeasurables, Apamanya. Okay, so basically, Metta, universal benevolence, followed by Karuna, compassion, selfless giving, uh, then followed by Mudita, which is altruistic or selfless happiness, and Upeka, which is the equanimity of mind or the mental equilibrium, the stillness of mind to the state where you are able to see through the realities of life. So basically, these are the four uh, divine dwellings. Now, um, although Bhante did not publicly mention it, but uh, in my discussions with Bhante Punaji when he was still around, he mentioned that uh, the Arahan, a person who has attained uh, enlightenment, the mind is constantly uh, within these four states. That's why it's called divine dwellings, the four divine dwellings. The mind of the Arahant is constantly within all these four states that that person, that the Arahant has a very broad mind concerned for all beings and has uh, depth, right? Karuna is the depth dimension and deep compassion for all beings and experiences altruistic happiness this is the not the happiness from pleasures, but the happiness from being selfless. And finally, a state of mind which is very still and calm, equanimous, right? luminous mind. So this is really the, the mind of the Arahant that's constantly in these four states. That's why it's called the four immeasurables. The, you, you cannot imagine what they are like. And in fact, the Buddha did point out in one of the sutras, there are four things you, you cannot really explain. If you try to explain it the, or debate about it, uh, you could go, go crazy talking about it. And basically, it's uh, the mind of an arahant right, in these four states. So now let's listen to what Bhante has to say about the karuna part, the second part. Okay. And when we cultivate metta, Metta turns into Karuna. Karuna is not another kind of thought or a different kind of mental state. Karuna is an expansion of Metta. Metta grows into Karuna. When we practice Metta, Metta grows into Karuna. Then what is Karuna? Karuna is where we don't distinguish between ourselves and others. That others are as important as ourselves. Karuna is like the depth dimension. Metta is like the length and breadth, the area dimension. And Karuna is how deeply are we interested in the welfare of all beings? Just as a mother thinks of her only child, and is even willing to sacrifice her own life for the sake of this child. In the same way, we begin to become 
concerned about the welfare of all beings and we lose our selfishness. In Karuna, the selfishness disappears. Just like a river falling into the ocean and loses its identity. It becomes the water of the ocean. The river is no more. In the same way, when karuna appears, the self disappears. And that disappearance of self means all unhappiness disappears. Because all unhappiness is self-centered. All unhappiness is self-centered. So when we practice karuna, which is the depth dimension, then all the self-centeredness disappears. Okay. So we were to look at these four uh, Brahma Viharas. Now, it is possible that when you practice metta and you deepen your practice to karuna, and if you continue to practice, and you will realize uh, eventually attainment of upeka. When you reach that state, then it is possible to become enlightened through uh, liberation uh, by wisdom. Right. So this is uh, Bhante will explain that the cultivation of Brahma Vihara, going beyond Karuna. That means you're not only just practicing compassion. Now you are going beyond that. So let's listen to Bhante's explanation of going beyond that, right? When karuna comes up, your self disappears. And when the self disappears, all unhappiness disappears because all unhappiness is self-centered. So when all unhappiness disappears, you are happy. And that happiness is not an emotional excitement. The emotional excitement disappears. The mind becomes calm and tranquil. So it is the happiness of tranquility of mind. That happiness of tranquility of mind is centered within It is not a reaction to what is going on outside. The happiness that is centered within
is not disturbed or agitated by the changing circumstances of life. the changing vicissitudes of life gain and loss fame and ill fame praise and blame pleasure and pain these are the changing vicissitudes of life the eight changing vicissitudes of life atta loka dhamma atta loka dhamma your mind is not shaken by these changing vicissitudes of life the mind is tranquil within and this tranquility within is focused within this is really you have entered the fourth jhana the metta meditation properly developed is the first jhana karuna properly developed is the second jhana mudita properly developed is the third jhana upekka properly developed is the fourth jhana very interesting that uh bante pointed out right uh just one minute yeah very interesting that bante pointed out that uh when metta uh, now i'm i'm paraphrasing bante he says uh, is the first jhana but i'm paraphrasing what what i believe he really meant is metta when cultivated and developed leads you to attain the first jhana karuna when cultivated and developed can lead you to attain the second jhana mudita when cultivated and developed can lead you to attain the third jhana and upeka when cultivated and developed can lead you to attain the fourth jhana and at the fourth jhana you are now at the doorstep of awakening so it is possible that uh, with this practice this regiment of practice it is possible to gain enlightenment right when you reach the fourth jhana then you are at the doorstep of awakening you can become enlightened uh, by wisdom so basically that brings the end uh, of my presentation uh, now you can actually when when the tiny.cc website is up running again you can go to this link and see uh, the complete discussion by bante on the brahma vihara because what i showed here is just a clip that i took from there so you can see the longer discussion which came from the most thorough meditation retreat he ever did back in December 2017. Many of us were very fortunate to have attended. The reason why is that uh, at that time, in December 2017, the, there was a group of monks from overseas, from, uh, 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 yeah, never mind, I, I forgot the place. Anyway, there was a group of monks uh, who came from overseas, four monks, who came from overseas and they attended that retreat and Bante was actually very inspired to give a very deep uh, teaching 
during that retreat, Bante taught some very deep things. So if you go to Bante Punaji's uh, YouTube and look up the nine-day meditation retreat that happened in December 2017, that, that uh, series of recordings I did, and it so happened that that was the only time when I recorded every single thing that happened. So there were a, a lot of gems. So if you go to Bhante Punaji's YouTube channel and look for the nine-day meditation retreat that happened in December 2017, uh, this was just six months before Bhante passed away, actually. Uh, so you will find some real gems in there. Right? Unfortunately, after that, Bhante did another shorter retreat in March and uh, 2018, then he went to Sri Lanka to finish a few books. And while in Sri Lanka, uh, he passed away very peacefully, right? So anyway, go to his YouTube channel and you can find those gems there. And this brings my sharing to an end. Uh, again, uh, you can download this after the Tiny CC website comes back on. Uh, meanwhile, there is a question I would like to address now um, from Brother Adisa. I hope you are still online. Brother Adisa is right now in United States. I'm not sure exactly which city you are in because uh, I think you were traveling and you were meeting up uh, Mike Dimio and, uh, uh, and Brother Steve Lin. In, in one of the temples there. So I saw that in Facebook, very interesting. So your question, Brother Adisa, householder and lay person, are they the same? Now, not really in that sense. Practically, you could say it's the same, but there's a, there's a very subtle difference. A householder is a lay person who remains living with family, friends, and engaging in social activities uh, in his circle of friends. That is the householder, still experiencing household life. In this case, such a person has not yet renounced. So this is not a monk or a nun or an ascetic, has not yet renounced. Therefore, that person is a lay person. A lay person refers to a person who is not yet renounced. However, a lay person can also not renounce, that means not become a monk or a nun, but live in the forest and disengage himself, disassociate from worldly life. Such a person can be living in retreat in the forest. And by doing so, that person is no longer a householder. So you could say a lay person uh, is not necessarily a householder in this case. A lay person who retreats from conventional world and lives in the forest uh, in, by himself or, or with only like-minded people, then such a person is not living a householder life. And that person could stand a chance of becoming enlightened. So that's really the, the subtle difference between the householder and the lay person. Okay. So I hope that answers your question, Brother Adisa. Uh, meanwhile, I don't see any other question for now. So uh, I'll bring my sharing to an end. So... Now, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to put it down below today's sharing. And then you may also send me an email. If you have questions, you can send me my email or if you can contact me through Facebook. Right? So let's now uh, compose our mind for a little bit. Just relax. We have spent the last 90 minutes or so sharing, well, last one, uh, yeah, nearly 90 minutes sharing the Buddha Dharma. So we have accumulated uh, a lot of good merits from our good and productive effort here. So therefore, there are many people around the world who are suffering from uh, coronavirus pandemic. So let's put our palms together and recite together to share these merits with all the people around the world who are suffering from coronavirus pandemic. So let us recite together. We dedicate the merits we have acquired from sharing the Buddha Dharma 
to all beings affected by the coronavirus pandemic around the world. May suffering beings be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May grieving beings shed all grief. May all beings find peace and relief. By the grace of the merits we have acquired, may we never follow the foolish. May we follow only the wise until we attain the highest and most supreme bliss of Nibbana. Idang me nya tinang ho tu, sukita hon tu nya tayo. Idang me nya tinang ho tu, sukita hon tu nya tayo. Idang me nya tinang ho tu, sukita hon tu nya tayo. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you very much for joining today's sharing. So I wish you well. Please stay safe. May you be well, comfortable, peaceful, and happy. Thank you very much. Sadu, sadu, sadu.